Welcome to part two of the head gasket repair tutorial where I'll be rebuilding the top half of the engine on this 1988 Porsche 944. Before we begin, there is quite a bit of content here, so if you're looking to advance to a particular section or procedure, check out the chapters along the progress bar or the timing links in the description. In summary from part one, this car was experiencing some sluggish performance and some coolant consumption and a compression test on cylinder four resulted in a value of 30 PSI. And so that's why the head was pulled off for head gasket repair. And during the teardown process, it was discovered that the intake valve was not properly sealing on cylinder four. And now everything has come back from the machine shop, the head's rebuilt, and the intake manifold and camshaft housing have been cleaned and reconditioned. A whole number of parts orders have come back. Had one final parts order come in, which should include everything we need to finish up the rebuild. And in here is a replacement coolant expansion tank, some new rollers for the balance shaft belt and timing belt tensioners, some odds and ends, a new bolt for the cam gear, dust cover for behind the distributor rotor, and a rubber plug for the camshaft cover. And that's everything I think we'll need. We had closed out part one with some cleaning of the gasket mating surface on the engine block. And now with all the parts on hand, we're ready to begin the rebuild. Uh, as I go through, I will demonstrate and describe each stage of the process so we can see some of the work involved. And if all goes well, the engine should be rebuilt in pretty short order. I'm excited to wrap up this project and get the car back on the road. Here's an overview of the parts that will be used in the engine rebuild for the head gasket repair. Of course, we have the head gasket kit and associated seals, refreshed exhaust manifold with new hardware, completely rebuilt cylinder head with new springs, guides, and seals, new hardware, fuel injectors that have been cleaned, rebuilt, and flow matched, camshaft housing and intake manifold that have been cleaned and powder coated, new cam gear cover, return the distributor cap, rotor, and spark plug wires, placing some hydraulic valve tappets, number of parts that have been cleaned and zinc plated, a new coolant expansion tank, various nuts, bolts, and washers, new rollers for the tensioning on timing belt and balance shaft belts, return the belts, timing, balance, and accessory, return the covers, new spark plugs, cooling fan assembly, new air filter, and finally, air filter housing and airflow meter. I want to take a minute to break down the gasket kit itself because Victor Rines does not include a list of part numbers in the kit. It's not available on their website and they don't release it to retailers. So sometimes there's questions as to what is included and what goes where. Uh, most of it you can kind of figure out by looking at it, but we'll take a look at everything. The largest piece obviously is the head gasket itself. These do say turbo on it, and the part is interchangeable, so whether you have a 944 turbo or an actually aspirated, it will be the same part. Second largest one is the camshaft housing seal, or gasket. It's got some metallic coating on the ends of it. it does include a box of valve stem seals, so if you're doing any valve work, Placing guides or springs makes sense to do those as well. The front camshaft oil seal is just kind of floating around in there. Uh, this goes on the front of the rear portion of the camshaft gear cover. This bag had two O-rings. The smaller black one is for the rear of the camshaft gear cover. This larger red one goes on the throttle body in connection to the intake manifold. It's not required to remove the throttle body during this repair, but if you decide to replace all the seals, that's where this one goes. Be careful with this little bag. It has the front and rear coolant flange seals that go on top of the cylinder head, but it also includes the 
tiny translucent thin plastic gasket that goes on the camshaft behind the spacer sleeve. Don't want to lose that one. This cork one is for the rear cover of the camshaft housing. It has all the exhaust manifold seals, four for the top, two for the triangular flanges at the bottom, four intake manifold seals. A uh, general rule of thumb with gaskets on this car are that the lettering or the writing will go face up when you install the gaskets. Uh, one exception to that that comes to mind is the intake manifold where that cylinder number one is flipped due to the spacing on the bolts there. Also includes six aluminum crush washers or seals for the plugs on top of the camshaft housing. And finally, little round rubber gasket that goes in the lower corner of the rear camshaft gear cover. So there it is. Uh, we'll talk about them a little bit more as we go through and put them on, but um, that's kind of an overview of what you've got in there. As I'm preparing to reassemble the engine, I thought it would be a good idea to do a quick rundown on the cylinder head refurbishment. So the machine shop obviously resurfaced. The head, five thousandths, was shaved off the surface, and all the valves were rebuilt. Everything checked out on the valves. Nothing was bent or significantly damaged, but the valve seats were essentially thrashed. Uh, specifically, the exhaust ones were heavily pitted and slightly oblong shaped. So all the seats have been recut and the valves have been lapped. And a leak down test was performed on each cylinder, and everything checked out great. So. Looking forward to see how the car runs with the new head on. On the top side, the guides were installed and reamed to accommodate the valve stems. New springs and seals and the valve stem heights were cut to the original factory specification. The spring rate tested at 120 pounds. Uh, so the, the normal naturally aspirated part is around 95 pounds. These are ones for the turbo. So added about 25% to the spring rate. And I did block sand the other mating surfaces with some thousand grit sandpaper just to remove any old gasket material and make sure it's ready to receive the new seals. Uh, two new core plugs were installed as well. And I didn't have it fully blasted because some of the project costs were running over, but I did wire wheel it pretty extensively to get it cleaned up. And I spent about 380 at the machine shop and a little over 120 in parts. So around $500 for the, the rebuild on the head. You can purchase ones that are already rebuilt for 750 to $1,000. So I did save a little bit and the car gets to keep its original cylinder head, which is pretty cool. So it's all ready to get reinstalled. And the first thing we'll do is put the gasket on and get the head locked down. I've got the head gasket unwrapped here, ready for installation. And before doing so, I did one final inspection of the engine block to make sure that the surface was clean and dry. And I passed a shop back over to remove any dust or debris that had accumulated since this was sitting for about a week. And these gaskets will be installed with the lettering face up and just match up the water outlet to here and we'll slip it on. Right over the studs. And make sure that it sits on these two little pins. And when we put the head on, we'll make sure that it's firmly and evenly planted on those pins as well. With the cylinder head properly seated, we can begin tightening it down. I'm going to start by installing the bolts for the water passage. Those are the M8 by 1.25, 55, and 35 millimeter lengths. I will put a little bit of anti-seize on these to prevent them from 
freezing up like they were before. Next step is to apply a light film of engine oil to the threads on each of the studs. Followed by the washers. If your washers have a rounded side, the rounded side will go face up. These are squared off, but there is a coarse side and a smooth side. So I'm going to put that coarse side down. The factory workshop manual indicates that the washer must not turn while turning the nut. And the idea there is that the torque reading could be inaccurate on the wrench if the washer is turning as well. Probably more important with the earlier cars where the three-stage process is 15 followed by 37 and then 66. Uh, you want to have accurate readings on those. So check your engine specification and your part numbers to see what's appropriate. Uh, on this later car, I feel like it's less of an impact because we're only going to 15 foot-pounds and then the second and third sequences are just a 90 degree turn. So whether the washer is moving or not, the nut is still turning just 90 degrees. Um, and then we will torque them down from inside to out, alternating sides. So we'll start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So follow that same sequence for each of the stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three. And once everything is locked down, you're good to go. Uh, some people will wait the 15 minute interval in between sequences. Um, some people won't, I'll let you decide, uh, but it does allow the studs to stretch a little bit. I have the time and it's not gonna cost me anything, so I'll probably go ahead and do it that way as well. But let's go ahead and get everything locked down and we'll move on to the next step. Now that the cylinder head is tightened down to factory specification, we can install the two coolant flanges on the front and rear. We've got the gaskets from the kit. Again, the lettering will go face up on those. Have a new crush washer for thermo vacuum valve on the rear heater flange. And I'm going to install the drain bolt as well in the bottom of the block. Got a new crush washer for that because the old one was quite well mangled and all these bolts will torque down to 15 foot-pounds. Before I install the exhaust manifold I wanted to compare the two that I've got here. So this one on the right is from an earlier car. It is cast iron. has a production date of 1982. Picked this up on eBay for $50 and I had it glass bead blasted and it's coated in a pour 15 manifold gray so pretty durable and it won't oxidize which is nice. This is a stainless steel tube design original to the car. The 1988 version probably featured the best iteration of this from Porsche and it's advantageous in pretty much every way. It's got better airflow, improved heat dissipation and it's a lot lighter but the one area where it's deficient is that it develops cracks over time. And this one is starting to crack along this line here. And if this were a track car where I was concerned about 
weight and heat, I probably would have this welded and repaired, and it could crack again at that same location or another location. But because this is a driver and I'm focused on improved reliability, I'm gonna backdate to the earlier version because these basically never crack. And so I'll only have to do this repair once. And I just weighed these. Uh, this one came in at 18.2 pounds, and this was 9.8 pounds. So by going retro, I'm adding 8.4 pounds to the car. Not really concerned with it so much, uh, but I, I do like the improved appearance of this one and the fact that I won't have to worry about messing around with it in the future. To get the exhaust manifold in place, I'll first slide the 1-4 pipe into position, followed by the 2-3, and apply the gaskets. Next are the studs. Studs thread in with the short side into the head, and they are torqued to 15 foot-pounds. I'm then going to loosely thread on the nuts before positioning the gaskets and the hardware for the lower triangular flanges. There's a little bit of wiggle room that you can adjust the manifolds up and down, and I want to make sure that these are going to be in alignment before tightening down the top connections. Once those are loosely threaded below, I'll come back and I'll torque all the top nuts to factory specification, which also is 15 foot-pounds, followed by the lower connections at 15 foot-pounds. I've got the top connections all threaded in, and I ended up having to drill out some material on the one and four connection holes. I just needed to shift over slightly to get the studs on, and I also had to release the lower exhaust hanger because the catback system was pushing up at a weird angle, and that made it a lot easier to get in. So I'll go underneath, connect everything up, and then we'll tighten these down. It took a little while, but I was finally able to get all the hardware torqued down on the exhaust manifold. These cast iron headers are even thicker than the stainless steel, so it was even more difficult to get a wrench on some of these fittings. On a couple, I had to do an open-ended and just inch it along. For the torque value, I was able to get a flare nut crow's foot socket on a couple of these. and. Wrench it down to 15 foot-pounds. Then I put the combination wrench on there and I loosened that up and retightened it back to that same position and found that it was about two medium tugs for me and so I just kind of simulated that down the line. With this smaller wrench, uh, it's less likely to strip anything or break anything because there's less leverage on it. So I just did a similar value and everything is nice and snug. So next we're on to rebuilding the camshaft housing with new seals and getting it mounted to the head. In reassembling the camshaft housing, the first thing I'll do is attach the rear cover and support hanger with the new cork gasket. These get a light coating of grease on both sides and the bolts are torqued to six foot pounds. Next the camshaft will be installed with a coating of motor oil 
or general assembly lube so that it's nice and slick. Put on the new plastic seal on the front. Next comes the rear housing for the cam gear. Got the one, two, three seals on this. These can be leveraged out with pick tools. If you can get it on that inside lip where the soft rubber is, provided that we're not tearing up the surface of the collar. If this is really stuck in there, uh, you can use the drill method where put a small drill bit through that metal ring, followed by a screw, and then you can pull it out with some pliers. When these go back in, they'll get a coating of motor oil as well. And the front one can be reinstalled with a roll of electrical tape or PVC pipe of similar diameter and tap those in. The rear cover goes on the housing. The bolts are torqued to six foot-pounds. And then the camshaft key can be installed. The timing gear will go on the end of the shaft through the keyhole followed by the collar and its keyhole. And the 12 point bolt has a torque value of 48 to 52. So I'll just set my wrench to 50 foot pounds and torque that down. And then the assembly will be ready to go onto the head, but I will be swapping out some of the hydraulic valve tappets as well because two of them have gone soft. Here's a closer look at the hydraulic tappets or valve lifters. These are commonly referred to as a bucket lifter because of their shape and design. Oil fills the bottom of this bucket through this inlet. And in the center is a button or piston under which is a spring and a ball check valve to maintain oil pressure. Oil is supplied through the block and cylinder head up into the channel in this camshaft housing and into these veins where it fills the cylinder bores, and when the lifter is in a closed position, that inlet will ride along this channel, fill with oil, and then when it is compressed by the camshaft lobe into a open valve position, that inlet is effectively blocked off by the bore, rendering it essentially incompressible. So these don't need to be adjusted. There's a zero tolerance and they don't break or wear out. They should last the life of the vehicle. However, the one disadvantage over a conventional solid lifter is that because of that check valve, which can get clogged with carbon residue and sludge, they're more sensitive to the quality of engine oil and the frequency of oil changes. And so when I have these out, it's a good idea to test them to see if they are clogged or if they're still good. So when these first come out of the car, they should maintain uh, rigidity on this piston. You shouldn't really be able to compress it too much. Um, I've got a couple that have gone soft. So my three and my six lifter have gone soft. And if the car was recently run, they should be firm for a few weeks before they would leak out. Um, but these aren't as firm as I would like them to be. There's a few ways that we can prime them. I've got some replacements from Plyhammer's parts. Um, these are pre-owned, but I got a good deal on them, so I picked up 10 of them, and I primed them. You can submerge them in oil and press repeatedly on the piston to try to work some of that air out and fill it up with oil. And you can also alternatively put them in a jar and apply a vacuum to it to suck the air out. And once that's done, if we press on the lifters, we can see a few different behaviors. So first, once they're filled, if it's still soft or spongy, that check valve is probably clogged and the lifter is bad and should be replaced. On the other hand, if it's incredibly firm and after applying 50 pounds or more of pressure to it uh, and it doesn't leak out of the hole at all, that's also probably um, a bad lifter. And finally, a good lifter is one where if you put your upper body weight on it, 50 to 60 pounds, and you can see a little bit of oil weeping out of that hole, um, that's how we would know that it's uh, a good lifter, and you can keep those in the car. 
So I'm going to be replacing two with these that I have tested. These are all too soft, and this one was too hard, and so these ones checked out pretty good. So I'll just pick two of these and swap them out with my three and six when they go back in the car so that we have proper operation of the valves. With the camshaft housing seals replaced, we can now install the hydraulic lifters, the main housing gasket, and mount the housing to the cylinder head. The lifters are going to go in with some of this assembly lube. It's about 45 degrees in the garage right now, so this stuff is pretty thick. Uh, but if you're in a, on a warmer day, you can put that in the refrigerator or the freezer for about 30 minutes to increase the viscosity so that the lifters don't fall out when we tip the housing onto the head. I'm also going to go ahead and install the connector for the rotor, and I have a replacement bolt for this because the other one, my old one, was rounding on the head. These come pre-coated with some Loctite on them. Uh, it's recommended that these be replaced when they're removed, but if your bolt is in good shape, it can be reused. Just put some blue Loctite back on there, and the torque value for this one is four newton meters, which is about three foot-pounds. <music> we 
With the lifters lubricated and installed in the camshaft housing, it's now ready to be mounted to the head. Make sure that you check that your mounting surfaces are clean and dry. If any oil spilled down during removal, make sure we clean it out of any of these bolt holes uh, because it will throw off the torque value and could potentially strip the threads. If you removed your heater pipe, make sure that that's reinstalled so that it can be mounted to the two connections. Go ahead and apply the gasket. Again, the writing goes face up and we're going to align the two pins to the tabs on the gasket. And it's ready to go. Check your top dead center mark on the flywheel and ensure that the flywheel lock is installed. And also check your timing marks on the camshaft gear. Remember that we've got two lifters that are slightly elevated so they'll be compressing the valve springs on three and six. So as we torque it down, we will be kind of fighting those springs a little bit. Uh, there is no specific torque sequence for this particular part like there is with the cylinder head, but it's best to work from the inside out, kind of alternating and crisscrossing. The torque value for the six millimeter bolts is gonna be 15 foot-pounds and then the screw plugs along the top are 29 foot-pounds. Make sure that when we're threading the bolts on the upper portion that go inside the housing that those don't fall off. You can put a little bit of grease on the end of your tool to get some stickiness going when you insert those. And just make sure your lifters don't fall out when we tip it this way. So we have the 15 mounting bolts around the perimeter, the six plugs, and then two bolts in the front for the rear of the belt cover here. And once it's all torqued down, good to go and ready to install the timing belt. With the camshaft housing installed, we can move on to the timing belt and balance shaft belt. To install the timing belt, we'll first confirm that the flywheel mark is properly set to top dead center and that the timing marks on the cam gear are aligned as well. We'll start rounding the belt down below around the crankshaft sprocket in between this rear belt cover, tilting the belt slightly and gently working it in. Try not to excessively twist or crimp the belt as that could damage it. As the belt is being routed, we will install the spring tensioner. The connections on the spring tensioner, as well as the guide plate, are tightened to 15 foot-pounds. The tension will be pulled up along the upper span. Remember that the crankshaft is going to spin in a clockwise direction, so as soon as this starts to move, we want this to move with it for proper timing. If there's any slack in there, we'll be, there'll be some movement on the crankshaft taking up the slack before the cam gear starts to spin. Route it down over the water pump pulley and in front of the tensioning gear. We'll then release the tension on the spring tensioner and 
measure the belt tension using the tensioning tool. The engine will be rotated a few cycles to confirm that ignition timing is correct and the belt will be checked again to make sure that the tension on the belt is correct. And finally the idler roller can be installed right above the belt and that is torqued to a value of 33 foot-pounds. The timing belt is now properly routed with an initial tensioning set using the spring tensioner by releasing the two connections and then locking them back down, testing the tension on the upper span with a 90 degree twist. If you happen to have an earlier car with the eccentric roller, uh, you can just turn it counterclockwise and then lock down the 17 millimeter nut once this uh, twists to about a 90 degree interval. And so what we'll do now is remove the flywheel lock and rotate the crankshaft two times or the camshaft one time around and then we will reverse the direction counterclockwise one and a half teeth going this way to relieve tension on the upper span and then we'll take a measurement using the tensioning tool. There are a few different tools out there that you can use. Uh, the cheapest one of course is the 90 degree twist method. That does introduce a human component However, and moderate finger and thumb pressure to one person may differ from another. There are also some low cost alternatives, the Cricut or the Gates belt tensioning tool, and the general consensus on those is kind of work for serpentine belts, but um, not as consistent for timing belts. I've never personally used it. And then on the high end of things, of course, is the Porsche P9201 tensioning tool, which runs about $1,000. So the Ironworks tool is probably the best quality aftermarket option and uh, it has been providing some consistent results for me. These spring tensioners are sometimes referred to as auto tensioners and they're not really an auto tensioner in a sense that they apply the correct tensioning to the belt. Uh, in fact this one I've found frequently applies too much tension after taking a measurement on the tool and I have to kind of back it off a little bit. Um, so while they could get you by for a short span if you needed to, it is best to um, be a little bit scientific about it and take a measurement using some kind of tool to make sure that it's accurate. For the longevity of the engine, it's important that the belt tension is set correctly. If it's set too loose, the belt could potentially start skipping teeth and then the timing is off and the engine 
would not run properly and if you skip too many teeth then you're going to damage your valve train by pushing it down into the pistons. If it's too tight we put unnecessary stress on things like the water pump pulley and there's a bearing in here that goes connected to the shaft on the impeller and that could prematurely wear out starts making an awful noise and it could also put some unnecessary stress on your camshaft and things so um, if you're gonna do the 90 degree twist method and kinda roll with it, it's best to be a little bit too loose than a little bit too tight um, so if you if you twist it and you can't quite get it vertical then it's probably too tight uh, if it goes far beyond vertical then it's too loose uh, but essentially just trying to get it right in that middle point there um, but we'll use the tool in this case and we'll make sure that everything is to specification so we'll apply the tool here on the span take some measurements and I personally like to check it twice so I'll rotate it around a second time and check the tensioning one final time and make sure the timing is correctly aligned before moving on to the balance shaft belt with the flywheel lock removed, we can now rotate the crankshaft two rotations using the 24 millimeter deep socket, which will be one rotation on the camshaft. We'll look for the OT mark on the flywheel and then confirm that the cam gear is correctly timed as well. And if everything is in alignment, we'll go ahead and back it up 10 degrees, which is about one and a half teeth on the cam gear to relieve pressure on the upper span and then we'll take our measurement. To properly position the Ironworks tensioning tool there is a recess in the lower bracket of the tool that will rest upon the upper nut of the guide plate. Make sure that the two aluminum sleds go on the top of the bell and the pin goes underneath the bell in between some of the nubs. Then the locking connections can be released on the spring tensioner and the tensioner can be moved forward or back to increase or decrease pressure. Check the dial on the gauge and ensure that it is within specification. Then pop the gauge by pulling the connection at the top a couple times, let it settle in, and then you can adjust forward and back as needed to make sure that it is properly tensioned. Bruce will sometimes make modifications to his tools and update the associated instructions as well, so just make sure you're following the instructions for your tool. This is the 920X version 6.1, so the values that I'll be looking for on this used belt that has 2,000 miles on it are .x01 to .x05, 05 being looser than 01. If it were a new belt, I'd be in the .x90 to .x97 range. He uses an X here on this tool. Um, it's the tense position, which is red on the smaller dial. If the tool is calibrated, you really don't need to look at that too much. It'll sweep around and fall within the indicated ranges. Um, if you have the newer tool, the 6.2 includes some different values um, as well as that tense position. So just make sure you're looking at the right information. And once you have the tensioning value dialed in, you can remove the tool and set the engine back to top dead center so that we can begin to install the balance shaft belt. I've got the engine set back to top dead center and the flywheel lock reinstalled for the balance shaft belt. And last thing we'll do is put in a little idler roller. This bolt is tensioned again to 33 foot-pounds. And I like to put a little bit of blue Loctite on these because when I first got the car this bolt actually backed out and made contact with the belt and got launched up here and wedged in between the belt covers so I uh, got lucky that it didn't tear anything up but I like to make sure these are nice and secure because of that. To install the balance shaft belt it will first be routed below the crankshaft sprocket up around the upper shaft over the idler and the tensioning roller and then back underneath in between the upper section of the lower shaft and this idler and then back down underneath the crankshaft. Once it's in position I like to temporarily wedge a shop towel in here so that there's pressure applying the belt into the teeth of this gear and then we can pull the slack up and around and back down so that the alignment marks don't move as you're tensioning the roller and that way you don't have to worry about 
moving it forward or back, um, everything's tight. And then once we get the correct tensioning value, you can just pull that rag out and lock everything down. We'll be using the spanner wrench to hold the position of the rollers and a 17 millimeter socket to lock them down. The tensioning tool to evaluate the tension setting on the belt, a dot five millimeter feeler gauge that goes in between the roller and the lower shaft sprocket. Some of the sources will tell you that there is a one millimeter clearance on the upper span over the roller. The factory workshop manual though has that written as a deflection uh, between zero and one millimeter so it just apply a little bit of upward movement on the belt to prevent slap going on and so that's how we'll set it. As the balance shaft belt is being routed, you want to make sure that the two alignment marks are in correct timing. So they're located on the back plate of each of the shaft sprockets. And on the upper balance shaft, that aligns with a notch in the top of the belt cover. And on the lower balance shaft, it aligns with a tab protruding from the lower section of that belt cover. The routing is simplified by having the idler roller positioned off and to the right and you can kind of lock it down so it's out of the way while you route the belt and as you move the belt over the tensioning roller you can just turn that to the loosest setting to get some more wiggle room there and work the belt on. And because I've removed all the slack from the belt sections right before contacting the upper and lower shafts in between the crankshaft sprocket there's essentially no movement in the shafts away from their alignment marks as we turn the tensioning roller because it's just removing slack from that upper span. And so an initial tension is set on the roller, testing a 90 degree twist on the belt, and you can remove the towel. And now the belt is properly routed and ready to take a reading on the tensioning tool. Before we apply the tensioning tool, we just want to make sure that the slack is on this upper span by giving it a couple pulls. And when we apply the tool, the aluminum sleds will go on top of the balance shaft belt and the shaft pin will go underneath in between two of the nubs. And once it's in position, you can pop the gauge and take a reading. With the belt tension measurement tool in place, we can go ahead and release the lock nut on the tensioning roller. You can turn the roller clockwise to tighten or counterclockwise to loosen and just watch the gauge as you turn it back and forth. And once it's in alignment with the correct value, you can go ahead and tighten down the lock nut on the roller and remove the gauge. The deflection values that we're looking for on this particular tool, whether it's a new or used belt, are going to be .x06 to .x14. Next we'll install the half millimeter feeler gauge in between the idler roller and the lower shaft sprocket. You can turn the idler adjustment up just a little bit so that we have a zero to one millimeter deflection on the upper span of the belt. So the belt's just resting on the roller. And then while you're holding that adjustment nut in place, you can lock it down with the 17 millimeter. Now that everything is tensioned correctly, we can go ahead and set the nuts to the 33 foot-pound specification, tighten everything down, or remove the flywheel lock, and rotate the crankshaft twice around. 
and confirm that all the timing marks are in alignment. It's not uncommon for the timing marks on the balance shaft sprockets to be off by about a half a tooth and still be accurate. Uh, you can see I can even wiggle this belt cover back and forth, which kind of changes the alignment. But if they're off by a full tooth or more, that would be something that you'd want to check and make sure that it's properly aligned. A properly tensioned balance shaft belt is going to seem quite loose in most cases, uh, significantly looser than the timing belt and even the accessory belts. And if you're going to do a 90 degree twist on it, you're more than likely going to be able to easily twist it just past 90 degrees, and that's okay. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of force to spin the weighted shafts on here, so it's a pretty loose running belt. With the timing and balance shaft belts correctly installed and tensioned, we can now reinstall the front cam gear cover, front belt covers, and move on to the accessory belts. With the front covers in place, we can now install the lower accessory belts. The accessory belts are routed over these pulleys uh, below the car, and the ribbed belt is for the alternator, AC compressor, and this larger pulley. And the V-belt is for the power steering pump and the V-belt pulley. Once those are appropriately positioned, we'll go ahead and apply tension by twisting the turnbuckles. And these turnbuckles have a locking nut on each side. It's two 17 millimeter connections on the AC compressor and two 13 millimeter connections for the power steering pump. We'll then test the tension by applying an upward thumb pressure. The V-belt gets a deflection of just five millimeters and the AC compressor is a little bit tighter at just two millimeters of upwards deflection. Once it's appropriately adjusted, we can go ahead and lock down the pivot bolt connections on top of the power steering pump, which are 13 millimeter, and as well on the AC compressor, there's a 17 millimeter in front and a 13 millimeter in back. And then I'll reinstall the cooling fan assembly, which is best fed up from below the car. Bolt it down with the three screws along the top and three along the bottom and reconnect the power connectors. Now that the accessory belts and cooling fan assembly are in place, we can begin working on the ignition components. The ignition system consists of a distributor cap, a dust cover, a rotor, the ignition coil, spark plug cables, and spark plugs. So the coil sends a 12 volt current to the center of the cap, and that sends the charge through this metal connector inside which contacts the center of the rotor and sends it down to the sweeping arm. That arm spins around in synchronization with the camshaft, sequence of one, three, four, two. So it just sits and spins and triggers each of those connections and one, three, four, two translates as one, three, four, and two on the distributor cap. These parts are making physical contact and so there is wear that occurs over time and the recommended replacement interval is every 30,000 miles. Um, if they're going bad or have gone bad you'll experience performance issues like misfires or a no start condition so it's good to inspect and replace these periodically. The spark plug cables connect to each of the leads and then to the spark plugs mounted into the cylinder head and that way the current is sent to the appropriate plug to ignite the air fuel mixture in the cylinders for proper ignition timing. To install these parts we'll start with the dust cap. The factory workshop manual says to install the dust cover with some quick drying cement which is essentially super glue it feels a little strange to be super gluing parts to the car, but that's what it calls for. So just do a little bit around the edge 
before installing it. Otherwise, it'll just kind of float around in there and not be too secure. Next up is the ignition rotor. I'll be replacing this rotor because some of the plastic material chipped off during operation. And that just goes on mounted with the set screw. Followed by the distributor cap, we can see that the cap has the spring-loaded hooks to mount to the front of the cam gear cover. And if we position these hooks with the top one pointing to the left and the lower one pointing to the right, you can essentially just do a 90 degree turn counterclockwise to catch the adjoining hooks inside the cam gear cover. And if the hooks aren't catching initially, it's probably because they're not pushed in far enough. Uh, they need to be almost completely bottomed out in the housing to appropriately connect with the other hooks inside. With the distributor cap in place, we can connect all of the spark plug cables and the ignition coil cable. However, final routing of the plug cables will be deferred until installation of the fuel reel as they do pass underneath the high pressure fuel line at the front there. All the ignition components are in place with the spark plugs torqued to 18 foot-pounds and it's time to install the intake manifold. Installation of the intake manifold is pretty straightforward. We've got the gaskets ready. Remember that that cylinder number one is flipped so the lettering is face down and just look out for the little notches for the injector recesses. The eight six millimeter bolts across the top and the 13 millimeter bolt on the lower support bracket are all torqued to 15 foot-pounds. The remaining 10 millimeters, you can just kind of tighten them down. Those will be for the sensor connector bracket, the oil dipstick tube, and cruise control throttle cable if you have one. What we'll do is lower the manifold into position, and before we bolt it down, we'll reconnect the vacuum line coming from the idle control valve. At that point, it can be bolted in. Uh, you don't need to use any grease on the gaskets to seal them properly, but you can apply a little bit of grease if you'd like to hold them into position while you're lowering it. There's a few connections down here. So there's one for the brake booster, a couple of vacuum lines going to the throttle body, and the air oil separator connector on top. And then the throttle cable can be reconnected. And once everything's bolted down, we'll adjust the throttle cable, and then we will move on to the fuel rail. Adjusting the throttle cable involves removing the slack from this particular span of the cable. When you depress on the accelerator pedal, it pulls the cable and turns the throttle cam. The throttle cam opens the butterfly valve inside the throttle body, but it also activates the throttle position switch down below. And to prevent a delay in the throttle response, we'll just take up this slack. If it's too tight though, 
it could be activating that throttle position switch and result in a high idle condition. So you want to make sure that when you press on the cable or when you step on the accelerator that you can hear that click. And if you don't hear the click, it's probably too tight. So this is a little bit too loose. And what we'll do is we'll want to pull the sheathing back. So we'll loosen up the front nut to slide things back. And then we'll tighten up this one behind it. That's too tight. There we go. And the slack is now removed and we can lock these down. These are a 13 millimeter nut. And the final step is to get inside the vehicle and press on the accelerator and ensure that you can hear the click as well. And then we can reconnect our throttle position switch. To mount the fuel rail, we'll first need to install the fuel injectors. I had these injectors sent off and cleaned by RC Fuel Injection of Torrance, California. They went ahead and ultrasonically cleaned them. They flow matched them, tested them, installed all new parts, the top hat, the O-rings, and the spacers and they even painted the outer casings and it comes with a, a warranty for only 25 bucks per injector, so pretty good. I had done a DIY cleaning job on these last year and was kind of questioning the results of that and I'm glad that I sent them in because the initial test, two were fair and two were dripping and one had a really poor flow rate and then after the cleaning service much better flow rate and all testing excellent. So I'm excited to see how these operate when we put them in. When the injectors are removed from the car for a period of time, it's a good idea to keep them in an airtight container, preferably inside to keep moisture out so that they don't lock up. And typically you're gonna to wanna to replace the O-rings on it if they haven't been replaced recently. They have some O-ring kits that you can get for about $5 a piece. And you don't need to do the top hats and the spacers if you don't want to, you can just swap out the rings. But if your O-ring is really flat around the edge and hard, uh, you could have some leaks when you reinstall because it's an old and compressed ring. Um, if your rubber is still soft and has a rounded perimeter to it, uh, you may be okay reinstalling it, but not too expensive if you want to replace. When we put these in, we want to be careful not to damage the injector needle. And so they'll go kind of just straight down in with the connector facing back. And if you need to rotate them around a little bit to get them to seat, you can do that. You should be applying a light coat of Dexron 3 ATF to the O-rings top and bottom before mounting them so that they're well lubricated. That's the same stuff that goes in the power steering system. Next, the fuel rail can go on. Reattach the fuel pressure damper to the front with the high pressure fuel line. Just pass through your spark plug cables first before you lock everything down so that there's enough room to route everything to its location. The fuel pressure regulator will go in the back with two 10 millimeter bolts and this high pressure fuel line to the front of the damper. Once the fuel rail is properly seated onto the injectors, you can screw it down in with the front and rear mounting bolts. And then you can install the injector clips that hold it onto the fuel rail. Reconnect the power connectors to each injector and attach the two vacuum lines to the regulator and the damper. And then we'll be ready to pressurize the fuel system.
After completing installation of the fuel delivery components, I went ahead and reinstalled the starter and reconnected the positive terminal on the battery. I'm now going to pressurize the fuel system by accessing the fuse box on the driver's side. We're going to pull out the DME fuel pump relay, which is located at position G2 in the fuse box. And then we're going to apply a jumper to connections 30 and 87B. 30 is 12 volt from the battery and 87B is the connection for the fuel pump. And we're going to run the fuel pump for about 15 to 20 seconds, clear all the air out of the system and pressurize it with gas and then we can see if there are any leaks at any of the connections. Seems to be flowing pretty good. And I'm not seeing any leaks. This will also make the vehicle start easier when we get to that step. We won't have to turn the engine over as many times and reduces the likelihood of an engine fire because we can stop a leak before starting it up. But I think we're in good shape. Next step is to refill the coolant system. Before I refill the coolant, I wanted to provide an overview of the cooling system functionality. So the cooling system is comprised of the following main components. We have the coolant expansion tank, which leads to the radiator, where most of the coolant is stored and the electric fans mount, along with the water pump, and a series of hoses and pipes and connections that move fluid throughout the system. The water pump is the heart of the system. It's driven by the crankshaft in connection with the timing belt, which spins this pulley and turns an impeller inside the block and forces fluid in this direction, all through these water jackets to cool down the cylinders. And at the back of the system, it takes an upward turn into the cylinder head. So here's the underside of the cylinder head. We can see all these channels and cavities where fluid can pass through. And the four along the bottom are the oil passages that supply oil to the camshaft housing. The circular ones are just passed through for the mounting studs, but all these other ones are coolant passages so that the valves and the combustion area can be cooled as well. And when the head gasket is applied, it blocks most of those off to allow for directional flow. So only these ones at the rear are open. So it moves through here and exits this water channel here, which dumps out back into the block by these temperature sensors underneath the water pump and continues to drive it. So the system is essentially making a vertical circle to cool things that way. And it's also making a little loop through the oil cooler housing to cool down the oil. So it goes in and comes back out through the block. In the back of the system, there is a flange on the cylinder head, which supplies fluid through the heater control valve and into the cabin underneath the dash, the, the heat exchanger, and empties through the heater return pipe, back through the water pump. So it's doing another loop that way to heat the car. And inside the water pump is a thermostat, a spring plate, a gated system that is closed until it reaches a temperature of about 80 degrees Celsius when it begins to open and it's fully open at 90 degrees Celsius or 194 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, fluid can be drawn from 
the bottom of the radiator through the water pump that creates space in the radiator to allow coolant passing through the head to travel through this line at the top of the radiator passing through all these fins and the electric fans to dissipate the heat and so there's another loop going that way but the intent of the closed system is to allow the engine to reach operating temperature more quickly upon startup and that way the oil is at the appropriate temperature to properly lubricate all the moving parts of the engine the other lines are up here so there is an expansion line at the top of the radiator that will send additional air in the system to the tank and in this cap is a a spring so if this reaches a certain pressure at 5 or 10 psi it will expel coolant from the system down through this line if it's overfilled or if there's too much pressure so when we think about these components and how they work together when we refill the system if we simply refill the tank and the radiator that connects down here it's going to be nearly impossible for the fluid to go all the way up to the highest point of the engine and then fill the block as well so it's important that we fill the engine block separately with coolant as well as refill the main system in the radiator and by doing so we'll have far fewer air pockets and other issues um, inside the system and it's a lot easier to vent that way and get things up and running as easy as possible. So that's what we'll do. To begin filling the coolant system you'll need two gallons of coolant, a funnel, and some cat drags. It doesn't so much matter what color the coolant is because manufacturers have different colors for different applications but just check the container to make sure that it is applicable to the Porsche 944 because of the aluminum block. We'll begin filling the block using the upper radiator hose disconnected from the radiator side. Loosen the 12 millimeter venting bolt and place some catch rags all around that area. And lift the hose up, put the funnel in, and begin filling the block. When a steady stream of coolant begins flowing from the venting bolt, you can secure it down and reattach the radiator hose to the radiator. We'll then fill the rest of the system from the coolant expansion tank and go ahead and fill the radiator and the tank until you reach the uh, area between the minimum and maximum level. And now the system is as full as you can get it before pressurization. To pressurize the system you can use a coolant pressure tester or the gravity fill method. If you have the pressure tester just attach it to the tank and pressurize the system not to exceed 10 psi and continue to vent at the water neck until all the air is escaped and a steady stream is now flowing from the top. Close it down and you're good to go. If you're using the gravity fill method we'll need to vent for some additional cycles so at this point go ahead and start the car make sure that the HVAC system is set to full heat and we'll need to run the car until it reaches operating temperature so the two gates in the system are the heater control valve and the thermostat in the water pump and we need both of those to be open to evacuate all the air from all the different cavities in the system and once you've run the car to operating temperature shut it down and vent the system at the venting bolt catch all of that stuff that comes out once there's a steady stream you'll need to run the car probably a second and third time uh, just to get all that air out and because this is the highest point in the engine, if you can get that even higher by elevating the front of the car 12 inches or more off the ground, it helps uh, kind of work all that air up and out of the system. As you continue to vent the system and remove the air pockets, go ahead and check the fluid level at the coolant expansion tank. If it's fallen below that minimum level, you may need to add some more coolant and top it up and just continue the venting process until no more air escapes from the venting valve and then the car will be ready for normal operation. After I refilled the coolant system and completed the initial venting, I went ahead and reinstalled the air filter housing, reconnected the airflow meter, changed the air filter, changed the oil, and charged the battery. So I'll do one final system check before starting the car. Make sure that the battery 
terminals are secure, the electrical leads to the starter are reconnected, all the connections to the injectors are in place. Confirm your spark plug routing for one, three, four, and two. Are they going to the right plug? Sometimes the connections at the plugs will appear as though they're fully seated when they're not, so just give a good push on all of those. Is the throttle position switch and the airflow meter reconnected? Have you reinstalled the DME relay? And once everything looks good, time to fire it up. Well, we have ignition, but as you could probably hear, the engine's running a little bit rough, and it sounds like we have a misfire on one of the cylinders. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull all the connections for the fuel injectors, and I'm gonna manually fire these with a battery um, just to hear the, the actuation and ensure that they're not stuck. Um, I did have the injectors sitting for a couple weeks longer than I would have liked while I was waiting for some other parts orders, so hopefully they're fine, but if not, I'll just send them back and I'm gonna pull the plug cables and just dot those with some dielectric grease and make sure everything's seated properly. And we'll see if we can fire it back up. Well, after testing, all the injectors are actuating. However, the injector at cylinder number two is much fainter sounding than the others. So I don't know if it's partially clogged or stuck, but um, everything is greased and reseated. So we'll fire it up one more time and see if there's any improvement. And if not, it looks like we'll be sending the injectors back under warranty for a second pass through. And that wasn't any better. So I went ahead and pulled the distributor cap just to check the rotor and the cap in case there was some kind of strange breakdown, but everything is intact and contacting correctly. So instead of going for a drive today, it looks like I'll be pulling off the fuel reel again and packaging up the injectors to go back. And if a final cleaning service doesn't work on them, uh, we'll go ahead and replace the injectors. I've got these injectors out now and I've got them hooked up to just a nine volt battery. And these ones are firing pretty good. All three of these, but this one up here, which was number two, it's not even moving at all now. So, must be clogged up. So I'll get these packaged up and send them back to RC Fuel Injection. See if they can get that one squared away and then we'll go from there. Well, as I'm closing out the head gasket repair, aside from the injector issue, everything is looking pretty good. Oil pressure was at five bar, valve chatter cleared up quickly, a little bit of smoke at cold start dissipated within a few seconds and I haven't yet detected any fluid leaks. And from an appearance perspective with all the new and refurbished parts, the engine bay is looking great, so once the injectors come back, I'll get them installed and start working on a brief wrap-up for part three to include a test drive, a compression test, and a breakdown of costs. But in the meantime, enjoy and good luck with your repairs.